I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of endangered species because attitudes have changed significantly uh, since Europeans first came to the United States. When Europeans first came to the United States, there were incredible natural resources that had already been exploited in, in, in Europe. Uh, it was believed there was unlimited timber, unlimited wildlife, water in the prairies, incredible amounts of, of grass, uh, intact soils, and then later uh, oil, coal, iron, and other minerals were discovered. And so when Europeans first, uh, first came to the United States, there was no concept of extinction. Wildlife was so abundant that people believed it, it could never be exhausted. And in fact, if a, a species ceased to exist in one area, there was uh, the general assumption that it could be found somewhere else. And so on the East Coast, you had these incredible hardwood forest, um, hickory, ash, and, and other hardwoods, and they were simply burned for potash. And potash was used for fertilizer, and so they'd literally burn these forests and then ship the, the potash over uh, to fill demand in Europe. And of course, these forests were sources of food for the animals that, that uh, lived in them. The nuts provided food for the passenger pigeon and, and many other types of wildlife. And then the Midwestern prairies were, were the, one of the great grasslands of the world, uh, analogous to the uh, savannas of Africa with grizzly bears and millions of herbivores like bison. And, uh, and so just incredible habitat for, uh, for herbivores and carnivores. And I think most people know the story of the American bison. They were, uh, they were perceived as being limitless, yet during the 19th century, settlers killed over 50 million bison, some for food and a lot for sport. And in fact, on the picture on the uh, right, uh, you see a big pile of bison skulls that will be ground down and, and turned into fertilizer. And the fur trade uh, was another huge issue. Uh, on the left is a picture of uh, uh, sea otter pelts. And then the graph that you see here uh, shows pelt sales in thousands in, in the London market. Uh, and then after that, you see a drop beginning in the 1880s as their population started declining rapidly from over-exploitation. And in this picture, this is a picture of uh, people just clubbing fur seals to death for the, for the skins in Alaska in the 1890s. In 1913, a, a guy named William Hornaday wrote a book called Our Vanishing Wildlife. And at the, when the book was published, the passenger uh, pigeon was already extinct in the wild. And he basically started tallying the disappearance of, of species and also the amount of wildlife that was taken by hunting. And if you look at some of the numbers, uh, whoops, if you look at some of the numbers, um, this is a record of game killed in, 12, in a 12 month period in Louisiana, 3,176,000 ducks, uh, 1,140,000 quail, Okay, the total number of mammals taken, and this is one year in Louisiana, uh, 2,667,000. And so phenomenal numbers of, of wildlife were taken for as game and for sport. And so he attempted to list all species that were threatened with early extermination. The word extinction did not exist. And actually, it's kind of neat if you if you Google it, you can actually get the whole book free as an ebook. Just Google Our Vanishing Wildlife by by William T. Hornaday. And he listed six recently exterminated North American birds, the great auk, the Labrador duck, Paula's cormorant, the passenger pigeon, Carolina parakeet and the Eskimo curlew. 
In the lecture notes and in your Canvas notes, um, I'd like you to know a little bit about the history of three of them. Uh, I'll mention all six of them or uh, briefly, but you're basically responsible for knowing a little bit about the Labrador duck, the passenger pigeon, and the Carolina parakeet. The great auk uh, is a bird in the northern hemisphere that filled the ecological role of a, a penguin. And you can see the reduced wings, and it, it looks somewhat uh, penguin-like. It was once found uh, across the North Atlantic, but it was heavily hunted in the mid-1800s for feathers, meat, and then the fat and oil under the skin were also in, in high demand. Uh, there was a colony that lived on an island that was protected from humans because of terrible ocean currents. And unfortunately, that last colony uh, disappeared because volcanic activity caused the island to sink. And the birds were forced to, to locations where, where they were easily killed. And the, the final, uh, final few remnants of the, the surviving population were taken by collectors. Uh, because uh, collecting for museums was, was very popular during that time. The Labrador duck is one of the animals I, I'd like you to know just a little bit about, mainly because it's the first bird species in continental North America to go extinct. And it actually disappeared before they learned much about the biology, but it did winter close to the shore along the Atlantic coast of, of North America. The last specimen was collected in 1875. And so anyway, the Labrador duck was the first species that was found in continental North America to go extinct. The passenger pigeon is, is a, a story on its own because there were literally millions and millions of them. And they were seen, they were seen as limitless. They, people, the, people thought there is no way this bird could ever go extinct because they were, were so abundant. Um, and in fact, two, the year 2014 marked the, the 100th anniversary of the extinction of the passenger pigeon. The last one died in the, in the Cincinnati Zoo in, in 2014, and her name was Martha. And this is a picture in her, of her in, the, in her cage in the, in the Cincinnati Zoo. And so anyway, the, the passenger pigeon was once the most numerous bird on the planet. And I can't even imagine this, but you had flocks that were one mile wide and 300 miles long. And so when the birds flew over an area on the East Coast, the area would get dark as if storm clouds were in the area because there were so many birds in the air. And they had all kinds of competitions to kill the birds, and the winner of one competition killed 30,000 birds. Um, and then they were, there was also uh, hunting to send them to market on the East Coast. And so they were trapped, netted, shot, and clubbed, and then they'd burn fire with sulfur under the trees. And then they'd, and they'd put them in, uh, in wooden, wooden barrels and railroad them to, to the East Coast as a, as a source of meat. I don't know if you've ever heard of pigeon pie but pigeon pie refers to a, a meat pie made of, of passenger pigeons. And so these birds, which were, again, were once the most numerous bird on the planet, were completely exterminated within one human generation. The Carolina parakeet, uh, most people have not heard of this. It's the only parrot that was native to, to continental uh, North America, north of Mexico. And it inhabited the deciduous forest, the hardwood forest of the eastern United States, as well as riparian areas in the Great Plains. And like typical parakeets and parrots, it's a cavity nester. Remember, a woodpecker is a cavity nester also. And it ate the fruits and, and seeds of, of trees and other plants. Um, and it's similar to the passenger pigeon. It was regarded as a, a crop pest, and it was slaughtered in great numbers. Uh, and, the, and like the passenger pigeon, the very last representatives died at the Cincinnati Zoo. The Eskimo curlew, if you look down here, you see the migratory pathway. The breeding range is, uh, was in um, 
the Arctic area in northern Canada and Alaska. And then in winter, the winter range was South America. And so it would fly back and forth across the Midwest. And so uh, flocks migrating across the Midwest in the spring fed on grasshoppers and, and other insects. And the population was devastated in just a 20 year period due to a combination of, of three events, basically. Um, after the passenger pigeon disappeared, the curlew became a, a target for uh, market hunters. And also the Eskimo curlew during migration depended on the insects of the native tall grass prairies. And in the late 1800s, these were being uh, eliminated as the prairies were being converted to agriculture by the sodbusters. Um, and then the third, third factor that led to the extinction of the Eskimo curlew it was the loss of its spring food item, the, the Rocky Mountain grasshopper. And so anyway, William T. Hornaday did a lot of work on, uh, on species that were disappearing in, in his book. And he compiled a, a list of birds being exterminated by plume hunters. Plume refers to bird feathers. And uh, plume hunters would hunt birds because having feathers or parts of birds on ladies' hats was very popular in London and in other parts of the world. There's a very good book I would highly recommend by Renee Thompson called The, the Plume Hunter. And it talks about market hunting of, of birds for ladies' hats. And it talks about it both from the ecological standpoint and from the standpoint of the hunters themselves that were, were trying to make a living uh, um, hunting these birds. Uh, um, and so from that book, here's a, a picture of a plume hunter going out and, and hunting. And let me go back to the previous. A lot of the feathers came from things like great egrets and great blue herons and, and birds like that that were very common in Florida. And then you can see the kinds of ladies' hats are, that were very popular at the time. Uh, here's a picture of 1,600 hummingbird skins that were being sold for two cents each. Um, and so bird feathers for museum, birds for museums and, and feathers for hat were, hats were, were very popular in the early 19th century. Uh, and then here's a lady's hat decorated with a stuffed bird. The last book I'd like to mention is a book published in 1962 called Silent Spring by Rachel Carlson, Carson. The title of the book refers to the fact that the spring was silent. Typically in the springtime, you have the noise of many birds, nesting birds, because they're doing their calls to attract mates. But at the time, birds were disappearing because of the chemical DDT. And DDT was touted as this miracle chemical. It was sprayed over neighborhoods, it, uh, it was used in agriculture, and it was seen as a uh, miracle chemical, but people really didn't understand the impact of DDT when it got in the water system and worked its way through the food chain by biological magnification, which we've talked about in the past. And so anyway, Rachel Carlson, Carson, I'm sorry, Rachel Carson, uh, made the public aware of the hazards of DDT. And in fact, by focusing on the decline of birds, helped bring species extinctions to the forefront of the environmental movement. And when this book was published, uh, it, it was kind of the beginning of the, the environmental movement. There's a, a couple of really good biographies written on Rachel Carlson, Carson. Very interesting woman. She originally uh, uh, worked for the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department and, and created brochures for them. And she died early due to breast cancer, but, but kind of an incredible person. Silent Spring and her, her biography are both, both uh, worth reading.